Well, uh, Yoram's uh, essay uh, of several months ago, I guess it was, on the uh, Protestant roots of the nation state uh, was powerful, wonderful, insightful, and best of all, even historically true, as far as I can tell. Part of its power was that so few are recalling the Protestant role in birthing nationalism, at least not favorably. I was at a uh, Christmas party Thursday night in Washington uh, that included uh, much of the, the glitterati of a conservative Christianity in Washington, to the extent they exist. And a few of them I shared uh, about this conference uh, regarding nationalism, and I got frowns and uh, quizzical looks. So uh, even there. The number of serious Protestant thinkers who theologically defend the nation state could probably be counted on one hand, and uh, several of them are in this room. And I know of almost no senior church officials, spokespersons, church documents, or influential church literature in serious Protestant and evangelical circles that specifically affirm nationalism. Nationalism is an ill odor among Protestant and evangelical elites. Although American evangelicals are certainly among the most nationalistic of religious uh, demographics, and David uh, referred to some of that, their nationalism is largely considered a source of embarrassment or at best a manifestation of confusion, a conflation of folk culture with Christian faith, requiring clarification, if not admonishments, from the less culturally contaminated and the more theologically astute. Every civic holiday in America, especially on July 4th, there are stern columns in the evangelical media warning against the dangers and idolatries of nationalism. This perspective comes from both the evangelical left and the evangelical right, and from those in between. Those on the left and some in the middle warn against all national loyalties as a compromise of Christian fidelity to God. The Christian's only communal and political loyalty should be to the church, which is universal, not national, they declare. Thinkers and commentators on the right make the distinction that Christians should perhaps, in a measured way, be patriotic, but not nationalistic typically not adequately explaining the supposedly enormous difference between the two. Some months ago, one uh, very thoughtful Christian commentator at a major uh, conservative seminary uh, through uh, the website of a major conservative denomination warned against nationalism, which he disparaged as an idolatry elevating nation over God. He said, and this is someone um, who represents uh, some, some of the... Uh, He's actually one of the best thinkers in a conservative uh, evangelical Christianity today, and I admire him very much. But he said, uh, speaking of nationalism, it's an arrangement in which the people deify the nation, viewing their nation as the savior that will protect them from the evil of being ruled by those who are different from them. Sometimes this rhetoric of salvation is overt, as was the case in Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. At other times, as in the US, it manifests in more subtle ways, regardless of the subtlety the road of political nationalism is perilous and an idolatrous one. He went on, in the modern West, nationalism generally refers to the inordinate allegiance one gives a modern nation state. The nation state attains a status that is grander than merely the aggregate of its citizens. Usually the nation is seen as superior to other nation states in its ability to exemplify some transcendent value. For Americans, this value is usually freedom because our nation possesses the highest value, we think, our nation must therefore be God's favorite, quote unquote. This sort of thinking goes beyond patriotism, which can be healthy and good, becoming the sort of nationalism that is an idolatrous ideology. He uh, continued, in contrast, a commendable patriotism looks on our country with affection, devotion, and even a measure of pride. To effectively counter nationalism, we need not love our own nation less, we need only to love, honor, and obey God more. And he went on to try to end on a hopeful note. For all of our failings as a country, we still have the opportunity to shape politics through the lens of the gospel. Well, he obviously had some uh, legitimate theological points, uh, but overall his uh, perspective was very incomplete. His comments, for example, were aimed exclusively uh, at the personally devout, as is usually the case with these sorts of critiques in the evangelical world. Focused on the integrity of the church, but disregarding the wider public good that should concern all Christians. He also portrayed nationalism as an almost uniform ideology, equally pernicious in different cultures and settings, without acknowledging that nationalism in its darker forms 
has rarely, if ever, been a threateningly powerful force in American politics. He likewise failed to consider whether a measured nationalism is not only desirable but necessary as a social good, indeed a potential remedy uh, to many global conflicts. Provocative, provocatively, and at risk of offending the two or three Baptists in the room, I, I wonder if uh, much of the uh, anti-nationalism from conservative evangelicals comes from an historic Baptist separatism that is uh, traditionally suspicious, if not outright rejecting, of human polities other than the church. There is often the often expressed concern by both the conservative and more liberal evangelicals that American nationalism, as they see it, conflates America with Israel and the Bible claiming for America special redemptive qualities unique to Israel. I would counter, uh, or at least suggest, that comparing America to biblical Israel need not be a blasphemous exercise, but could instead, in the right context, be aspirationally lofty, appealing to the very high holy standards of justice proclaimed by the Hebrew prophets. Evangelicals and other Christians on the left who critique nationalism often equate nationalism with Constantinianism in which, at least in some Protestant lore, the church uh, supposedly made itself the obliging servant of the state and of empire. Nationalism for them equals imperialism, militarism, repression, chauvinism, and perhaps even racism. The conservative writer I quoted earlier warned that nationalism gives, quote, one nation state a higher ontological and moral status than all other nation states, thereby making it easier to justify evils as the means towards the end of propping up quote unquote, God's nation. Christian commentators on the left are more hyperbolic even, comparing America at best to Rome or Babylon, or at worst to the Third Reich. Protestant and evangelical critics on the left against nationalism are usually influenced by the John Howard Yoder, Stanley Hauerwas, neo-Anabaptist perspective that insists all faithful Christians must reject service to the state because it is intrinsically violent. Hauerwas uh, has identified American nationalism as uh, particularly pernicious and July 4th as uniquely corrupting, in fact, uh, his least favorite uh, and even most hated holiday, because America, unlike other nationalisms, doesn't just make claims for its own people, but offers a narrative with universal application that competes with the gospel itself. We in this room are aware that it would be, but it would be news or at least uh, not seriously considered by many in the Christian world that there are many forms of nationalisms ranging from the diabolical to the godly. The most infamous and murderous, of course, was the Third Reich's national socialism. Somewhat more benign was uh, Franco's uh, Spanish nationalism, which was authoritarian, but not so much totalitarian, in which Catholics supported against uh, anti-Catholic uh, Stalinist and others. Uh, in some ways, Lebanon's Maronite uh, Catholic phalangists descend from some form of Francoism. Uh, other forms of Arab nationalism, often supported by Christians, sought modern unifying alternatives to uh, Muslim-influenced theocracy. The most vicious and disastrous forms of Arab nationalism uh, were the Ba'athist parties of Iraq and Syria, producing Saddam and the Assads. Uh, Turkey is um, Ataturk, whom I couldn't help but mention last night in terms of his relationship with Zsa Zsa Gabor. Uh, modernized Turkey with uh, secular nationalism. Chinese nationalism sought a modernizing uh, unity against feudalism and warlords, founded by uh, Sun Yat-sen and popularized by Chiang Kai-shek, uh, who was himself a Methodist and whose uh, Kuomintang party still survives in Taiwan today. India, of course, gained independence under its Nationalist Congress Party, which sought national cohesion under a secular regime, aspiring to equality for all religionists and caste. Uh, the main opposition against Congress is the now ruling Hindu party, often distrusted by Christians and Muslims, among others. The post-World War II Third World uh, anti-colonial struggles were typically led by nationalists whose rivals were often Marxist. The nationalists esteemed national identities while the Marxists ostensibly identified with an international communist brotherhood. Other rivals to nationalism, of course, uh, have been uh, tribalism. Patriotism in early America often meant primarily loyalty to uh, the colony or the state. Uh, America's earliest presidents sought a form of nationalism against local parochialism. There was, cert there was uh, no certainty that a national union would survive. When the Civil War arrived, uh, Confederates like Robert E. Lee, who revered Virginia, felt primary allegiance uh, to their native states, 
in that case, a greater nationalism could have been an antidote to disunion and fratricidal war. Martin Luther King and much of the civil rights movement was essentially nationalist, appealing to America's founding documents to articulate a transracial community in which all are equal as Americans. Some nationalisms are rooted in blood and ethnicity. Others have a religious component. Still others are attempts to foster a greater unity that transcends ethnicity and religion. Christians in many cultures have and do support nationalisms in their context as preferable to available political alternatives. Sometimes they are right to do so, other times they err, if for often understandable reasons. American versions of nationalism have not often been rooted in ethnicity or religion, but more usually in a concept of freedom traceable to our founding documents. Freedom understood apart from God is potentially dangerous, we here would all agree, as Christians and Jews have traditionally understood. America's traditional understanding of freedom descends from a Christian and Jewish anthropology, but can be universally interpreted to affirm dignity and equal rights for all. Maybe it's important for theologically literate American Christians to understand the supposedly significant subtleties between patriotism and nationalism, subtleties that to me often seem more semantic than substantive. But such distinctions may be inconsequential to many less observant Christians, not to mention the 25 to 30 percent of Americans who uh, now say they are religiously unaffiliated, whatever that means. For many of them, a form of nationalism may be more morally uplifting than hyper-individualism or ghettoization into racial, sexual, gender, or economic tribal identities. A nationalist American likely will have more motivation to be a better citizen and neighbor than a nihilist, an anarchist, or an indifferent materialist. Uh, Gandhi was a nationalist. So too was uh, Nelson Mandela. Both were instruments of providence, arguably, who strove to liberate and unite their peoples against ethnic and religious division without conscious, at least in Gandhi's case, or strict, in Mandela's case, adherence to the Christian or Jewish understanding of nation. If America becomes more secular and less Christian, some form of nationalism may offer the available threads of continued community and pursuit of the common good. Intra-Christian conversation about God's purpose for the nation will remain important to the churches, but less so for the wider public. Christians like Jews believe in a universal God who's sovereign over all peoples. It should not contradict the teachings of any major Christian tradition to understand the divine vocation of separate nations and the providential purpose conducive to love, justice, and peace for distinct peoples to esteem and serve their own beloved communities without seeking harm to other nations, indeed seeking the prosperity of all by beginning with the prosperity of their own. I think David described that concept very well. Similarly, Christians understand the unique bonds of marriage and family and of other ordained communities that privilege some loyalties over others, but which collectively serve the greater good, honoring God in the process. A husband and father who prioritizes his own wife and children rather than prioritizing the wives and children of his friends and neighbors is likely a better Christian and a better citizen. Likewise, a thoughtful, discerning, and godly nationalism rooted in fraternal affection will foster better nations and a better world than a thin universalism in which there are no primary loyalties to immediate community through the nation. Rather than simply berating sinister forms of nationalism, real or imagined, an effective Christian political witness will articulate a positive nationalism that steers human passions in constructive directions for the ideally good of all nations and all peoples. If Protestantism did indeed create the modern nation state, as Yoram has so ma magnificently described, then Protestants have a special obligation to safeguard that gift. Thank you.